It's a pleasure to see everybody out on a beautiful March uh, day. Uh, I want to acknowledge that we are meeting here today on the indigenous territories of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples. Uh, we're grateful, as always, for the ability to, to meet and to study and to learn on these lands. Um, before I introduce the, today's panel or today's speakers, uh, I want to call attention to an upcoming talk, which is the Duncan Sinclair Lectureship uh, in Health Services and Policy Research. Uh, this year, our speaker is Sir Michael Marmot, uh, who is Professor of Epidemiology at University College London, past president of the World Medical Association, uh, and he will be speaking on Monday, March the 16th at 5 p.m. Uh, so do uh, plan to come out. That'll be an uh, amazing talk. And today's talk is on issues around health and, and health uh, challenges. And we have a number of speakers. I'm not going to introduce them. I'm going to ask David Walker up to the podium in just a moment. Uh, and David will, will introduce the members of the panel. Um, <clears throat> we have Slido active, as we always do, in order to take questions. But we will also uh, take some questions from the floor. And because there are so many speakers, I want to hand right over to David so that David can get us going. So please join me in welcoming our, our panel today. Thanks very much, Warren. Uh, this is a bit of an experiment. We do this from time to time. Um, in the world of health policy, there are, as you might imagine, a vast number of challenges and areas across the spectrum. Um, and uh, many of the members of this panel are members of our Health Policy Council. Uh, so, uh, quite at random, I asked for volunteers, for people to come and talk for five minutes on a pol health policy challenge that preoccupies them at the moment, or is one that they're particularly fond of. Uh, it's an experiment. It sort of leads in, for those of you who've uh, signed up for MPA 836, our health policy course in the School of Policy Studies, and will likely be the foundation for a further uh, iteration next year when we do a health policy round every month throughout the year. So it's completely random. Those of you who like thematic things, there's no theme here other than the preoccupation with issues. Uh, for obvious reasons, I'm going to have Kieran Moore speak last. I'm not going to get into the wonderful CVs of all of our speakers except to say that we have John Muscadiri at the end, who's an intensivist at Kingston Health Sciences Center. He's the person who looks after you when you're unconscious on a breathing machine. Um, and, uh, and John is the head of the, uh, he's CEO of the Canadian Frailty Network, a national center of excellence program. Um, Kathy Zabo is a nurse who happens to be president and CEO of Providence Care, subacute hospital, you know, the wonderful new hospital out in the west end of town. Um, She's going to talk. Uh, Chris Simpson is Professor of Medicine. He's Vice Dean in Health Sciences, past President of the Canadian Medical Association. He's going to talk a little bit about technology and artificial intelligence. Kieran Moore is a Professor of Emergency Medicine and Family Medicine like me, but he's also our Medical Officer of Health. He doesn't have much to do these days, so he volunteered to come. Um, Ian Gilron is a Clinician Scientist at the KGH Research Institute. He's also an anesthesiologist. Uh, professor in Biomedical Sciences and Director of Clinical Pain Research. And he, of course, is interested in pain, chronic pain, and the flip over into the way in which opiates and other issues have uh, galvanized society. And then since some of us are physicians, but not all, but those who are not have an interest in this, Richard Schakowsky, who is Professor and Director of the uh, Industrial Relations Program School right here, is an, uh, cross appointed to law as an expert on health workforce and payment and how we pay people. If paying the way we pay people changes the way they behave, that's clearly important. He's already established the fact that most physicians are underpaid, so we like him. Uh, so <laughs> I look forward to what he says. We're going to start with Chris Simpson, who's going to have five minutes to talk about the health policy challenges of technology and AI. I have questions though. Well, thanks, David. Um, I, I've decided because there's only five minutes to really focus on what I know best, and that is uh, that's uh, medical technology. And uh, I'll start by saying, um, uh, you know, we, we know that as every provincial uh, government in Canada struggles with health care costs that are rising faster than uh, economic growth can support, uh, we, we see calls for health care transformation. Um, um, and these calls for healthcare transformation typically imagine that we'll be able to shift investments from the acute care sector to the community sector, uh, from low value care to care that gets us more bang for the buck, 
uh, and somehow to a place where we can help people age better and stay healthier longer. That's sort of the, uh, where most conversations like this start. Um, and uh, those of you who uh, have heard me speak before will, you, will know that I'm, a, I'm, I'm totally bought into that vision. The problem, of course, is that the need for acute care doesn't go away. Uh, people still get sick. They will always get sick, often towards the end of their lives. Um, they may be older when they get sick, but they still get sick. And the great triumph of modern medicine is that we're living longer and we're living better than at any time in human history. Um, and this surely can be seen as nothing other than a towering achievement. But the 60 and 70 year olds who used to populate the cardiac wards when I started my career 25 years ago are now 80 and 90 year olds and they have problems that we can fix. Uh, when I started training, no one in Ontario would dream of doing bypass surgery on an 80 year old. Uh, but today the average age of the bypass surgery patient in Ontario is 81. And they're doing well. They go home five days post-op, they live for many more good years. That's the typical experience. Um, so now we're on the cusp of a revolution in minimally invasive cardiac procedures. And that's where I wanted to sort of focus today as an illustration of, uh, of a health policy problem. Um, today we have uh, uh, leadless pacemakers. That's a leadless pacemaker uh, compared to this uh, with a wire attached to it. Uh, the infection rate is 0% when we put these things in. I put one in three weeks ago uh, in less than 10 minutes. Uh, these take uh, up to an hour to put in. Um, we have uh, uh, these procedures called TAVI, trans aortic valvular implant, where people with tight aortic valves, people typically 80 year olds uh, and over, who otherwise couldn't withstand an open chest procedure, undergoing a, a, a percutaneous procedure through the groin where they have their valve replaced and uh, walk out of hospital a day or two later. We have something called the mitra clip for people with mitral regurgitation who develop uh, heart failure. Uh, instead of, again, an open chest procedure, it's a percutaneous procedure that tightens up the mitral valve. Uh, they go home and do well. We have left atrial appendage closure devices to prevent stroke without the use of blood thinners. We have atrial septal defect closure devices. All these little, tiny, sophisticated pieces of machinery uh, that we can put in people's hearts uh, that have been shown to prolong and improve their lives. And we have this whole generation of implantable physiologic monitors that we can put in strategic places in your body to measure everything from your uh, electrocardiographic activity uh, to uh, pressures inside the heart that can help us uh, have real-time measurement uh, and therefore real-time intervention uh, in your care. And all of this, of course, is in addition to the bread and butter procedures like stenting and ablations and uh, things that have collectively revolutionized the treatment of cardiovascular disease uh, in Canada and around the world. And one of the things I used to say um, th is that my job as a cardiologist is to make cancer Canada's number one killer. And we've succeeded because cardiovascular disease is now number two. It's, uh, it's not number one. So uh, cardiac procedures in Ontario have traditionally been funded uh, by allocations to cardiac centers uh, called funded volumes. And so centers are paid a rate per procedure and we're not permitted to go over that number. Um, so the problem is, is that the development trajectory of these new procedures is very complex. Uh, clearly there's years of work to be done before these technologies ever make it to the clinical setting. But once they're approved uh, for use, there's another long time lag until funding comes from the Ministry of Health. So there's a long time that elapses from the first um, approved implant uh, to standard of care status. And Ontario's cardiac care centers are recognized as among the best in the world. Uh, we're typically involved in the early evaluation of these ne uh, new technologies. And that means that Ontarians uh, are usually among the first in the world to be exposed to these new cardiac technologies. Uh, TAVI is one recent example. Uh, 10 years ago, an 82-year-old with severe tightening of the aortic valve who couldn't withstand uh, open heart surgery would die from this, uh, usually not a very nice death. Uh, today they can have their valve replaced by a percutaneous procedure and they walk out of hospital, as I said, uh, the next day. The fact that Ontario's cardiac specialists are involved from the beginning means that they build expertise and experience and we build institutional experience. And when the procedures finally hit prime time and the funding comes, the centers are ready to scale and spread rapidly. But with no funding in these early stages, 
hospitals have to eat that cost. Uh, hospitals with rich foundations tend to gain early experience. This in turn positions them to be first at the trough when the funding does come. And it always seems to mean that some centers are out of the gate with new programs before others. And as a result, these differences get perpetuated. The end result is inequitable access for Ontarians. So simply put, why should Torontonians have preferential access to new approved procedures just because University Avenue rich hospital foundations have made the early investment while others have not been able to? One potential solution is to develop a funding mechanism to allow all academic tertiary care centres to participate in program development for new procedures and technologies that are clearly on a trajectory for approval so that they can develop institutional expertise and competence at a rate that will allow them to be fully up to snuff when funding is approved. This of course comes at a price because some technologies that appear promising at first can suddenly and unexpectedly fail and when this happens the investment has been for naught. One could reasonably argue that losing this investment in one or two centres only is better than losing a larger investment in many centres. So, to sum, should OTAC, the Ontario Health uh, Assessment Technology uh, um, Committee, or some other body, have a mechanism to choose emerging technologies that look very promising and approve more centres for provisional funding during uh, development? To what extent should the manufacturers of these technologies be compelled or persuaded or incented to underwrite or share the costs of program development in, in uh, mature uh, centres? Um, or is it a necessary evil that new technologies, once clearly established as standard of care, are rolled out inequitably in Ontario? I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Chris. <clears throat> Uh, next, since we're talking about the amazing interventions we can make um, in the elderly particularly, let's ask John Muscadieri to come and talk about his preoccupation, uh, and he can stay where he is if he likes, in terms of the, his role in the Canadian Frailty Network and as an intensivist. John? Oh, great. So uh, thank you, David, uh, for inviting me, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So I'm, I'm going to start off with, uh, first of all, a bit of context uh, about aging and then uh, segue into, into frailty and what we'd actually do if we were actually able to implement a public health approach to frailty and prevention of uh, frailty and then look at some of the health care aspects of uh, frailty. So we know, and I think it's no mystery to, to anybody, is that societies around the world are aging. Uh, Canada is no exception. So from a number point of view, about 16% of people in Canada right now are over the age of 65. And uh, this is going to rise to about 23% um, or over 10 million people in the next uh, 10 years. And, and, and that's a, a big demographic change. You have probably have all seen the, um, uh, all the articles that the number of people over the age of 65 surpassed the number of people under the age of uh, 15 recently. And that, that, uh, that changes society around. A lot of the programs that we have were traditionally geared to, uh, to children and to education, but now we actually have a bigger segment of our population that's older. Um, and then if you start to actually look at what we what uh, actually has happened with aging with over the past 50 years because of uh, advances in public health advances in medical science in and advances in social care we've been able to shift the aging curve so we've we've increased the longevity of the population um, and 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 a lot of people are surviving in good health with uh, maintained function but the other thing that that's actually happened is we've actually done the flip side so that a lot of people are surviving with with functional loss, um, with uh, with uh, high needs requirements, and and um, and and all reduced quality of life. So that tail end of that curve, if you look, if you graph uh, function and age, we've actually extended it a lot more. And these are the people that are typically require high health care um, service or have high health care service utilization. These are the people that require. Uh, a lot of uh, help or services and if you start to look at the impact on society so not only from a medical care utilization 
these are people that have high medical care utilization, but they're also the people that have requirements from informal caregivers or people not associated with the health care system and, or social care systems. And at the present time, it's estimated that there's around 4 million people in Canada that provide these services to older, uh, older adults. So, uh, so thinking going forward from a policy perspective, what can we do about that? We can throw up our hands and say all, all, is, all is lost. We've known about this for the past number of years. We really haven't done a lot about it. But, so what we need to do is actually think about what the paradigm is. And, and what we need to do is sort of figure out um, Current medical science says that we probably have a finite lifespan. We can't keep increasing longevity. And so what we need to do is change from actually the paradigm where we think about increasing longevity, but actually keeping people uh, with maintained function throughout their finite lifespan. And so, and there, there's ways we can do that, either through um, through technology, uh, through, uh, but probably more importantly is actually how we can prevent some of those things by by interventions of which are really common. And and one of the ways we can actually prevent people from becoming frail or actually reduce their progression once they become frail is is through an acronym called AVOID. So AVOID frailty. It really fits and it really encompasses all the things that actually uh, can do that. So AVOID stands for activity. We know that, uh, that maintenance of activity and exercise as you grow older is good for maintenance of function and also uh, probably is preventive against the, the um, development of dementias or, or cognitive loss. So maintenance of activity vaccination so there's vaccinations that we that people can receive so for example influenza vaccination shingles vaccination pneumococcal vaccination that may prevent the 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 start of that deterioration that happens when people get these uh these uh infections and we know that they that the rates right now are 50 uh, the, the penetrance rates or a number of people get this are around 50 to 60 percent so not very high we can pay attention to the medications that people are on. Um, so optimize the medications. Make sure that you're on the right medications for the right stage of your life that you're at. Um, and and uh, as people get older, the number of medications that they're on really rises. And it's astounding the number of classes of medications that some people are on. The, the other, the, so the I in avoid stands reduction of social isolation. Social isolation is, is an important determinant of you starting to develop functional loss or frailty. And public health aspects or social prescribing that we can do can reduce that. And finally, the last one is, is attention to diet and nutrition. So from a policy perspective, we need to ensure that, that, um, that food security is present in people that are older, especially in uh, low, income, uh, low income seniors. A lot of times as people uh, retire, their, their incomes drop and, and paying attention to um, uh, to food security is important, but what's even more important is the nutritional aspects that, that you actually get. Um, so from a policy perspective, the things that we can do in our society to, to enable all those elements, each one, is e each one makes sense, we, we buy in, but we need to do the things in our society to actually enable all of them as a package. And, and uh, some are maybe more important to others, but, but uh, that, that's in the details. And so, and finally, from an intervention point of view, and I'm glad I, I went after uh, Chris's talk, I, I think what we need to do is consider what interventions we do uh, based on what stage people's lives are and what their trajectory of life is. 
in some people that are, and we know that if you take into account frailty in, in what procedures you do, that really uh, determines the outcomes from any medical procedure. So if we know that you're on a downhill perspective uh, or trajectory and you're reaching the end of life, then sometimes medical procedures will not change, uh, will not change that. And, and uh, we need to be um, really cognizant of where people are in, in their um, in their life before we we do those things, so I think there there's things that we can do, and and uh, um, and and I think we, by changing our perspective a bit, we can actually enable Canadians to survive longer, in better function, um, within whatever finite lifespan happens we arrive at. So thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs> So a natural progression to the left would be to Kathy Zabo. Um, Kathy's president and CEO, as I said, of Providence Care, but uh, as importantly, she comes from uh, the community background of running a CCAC very successfully in North Central uh, uh, Toronto. So Kathy, five minutes on what preoccupies you in terms of the health policy ramifications of home and community care. Yes, I'm a pleasure to be here today. And um, I want to say that when you work in home and community care, you're in a high touch, low tech environment. I wonder, can I turn the mic off? I'm getting rebound. Is that okay? That's better. Try this one. Is this one better? Or is it still the same? Maybe I'll just back it up a bit over here. Can you still hear me? I bet you can. So I like high touch, low tech healthcare. I've spent my life primarily in home and community care and in the subacute system now at Providence Care and it's an honor to work with people who really believe that when people come to us that they need help, they trust us to get them the right care in the right place at the right time and appreciate that while we are keen to um, understand their medical diagnosis and treatment, and we do that really well, what we're there to help them with is to um, manage their activities of daily living across a continuum of care. So one of the first days I was here, one of the um, patients said to me, KGH saved my life, you gave it back to me. Well, I wanted to walk, and three years later I can walk. And they can walk because of the care that they received, not only at KGH, but at Providence Care, in their home in the community, in the outpatient clinic, and then through all of our adult day programs. So there's a whole host of different care delivery systems that we engage in order to help people manage their activities of daily living. So um, the current models of care that we have in Ontario rely too heavily on the acute care hospital resources. And we have a culture that emphasizes that an end place may be a long-term care home without the appropriate consideration of a patient's potential to improve, recover, or be cared for at home with the right amount of support. An outcome of this delivery system is often a burden to the emergency departments of hospitals our long-term care system where we know that there's 34,000 people currently waiting for beds and too many um, seniors and other people, <coughs> excuse me, waiting in hospitals to be tr transferred to somewhere else. And I know Kieran and I had a quick little sidebar about what's ahead of us in the next little while. And one of the pieces that we're looking at really closely in Kingston is there's 84 ALCs in KGH and there's 60 at Providence Care. Where do they go if we have an emergency and we need to treat a different level of care and people differently? The acute care hospital is not designed to meet a patient's restorative, supportive, or rehabilitative needs, but is shown to advance functional deterioration and a place where patients are put at significant risk of hospital-acquired required infections, falls, and other adverse events. If we take a look at a study that Kai Hai did, if you're in a hospital across all jurisdictions, the greatest factor influencing residential care entry is whether or not the assessment for that care was performed in a hospital. So if we can get people back at home, 
you'll find that less than the 64% that are identified in hospital actually go to long-term care. We're actually manufacturing people for the long-term care system. And we have a long-term care system or a community system that really looks at an end destination versus a place where people have to come and be restored. A day on a stretcher in a hospital equals a month of rehab for somebody over the age of 75. So we need to really mobilize the forces, the opportunities that exist for us right now are looking at how do we help seniors remain in their home. Unfortunately, the home and community care system in the last 20 years has faced major restructuring no less than five times. And that doesn't provide the amount of stability to go forward. And if you take a look at our hospital, our acute care hospital has about 480 paid beds. They're overbedded every day between 520 and 540. Those patients are not getting the operating funds for. Home care every day sees approximately 12,000 people. So do we want to invest in the 480 or do we want to invest in keeping people well and have them not have to go to an eMERGE department? How can we mobilize the community and the community resources to use the paramedics to the maximum of their ability, to take a look at how people remain home, and most of all, talk to people about what kind of care they expect from us, because they are at a vulnerable part in their life, so that we can be assured that when we need it, that Chris's pacemaker can be implanted immediately on the person that needs it. That that hospital is functioning as well as it can for the 480 people, not the extra 60 or 80 people that they're caring for that don't have an acute care illness. That they're getting the care that they need if they go home. When I was at the CCAC in the York region, we had a Lynn who was very progressive, or maybe they just kept getting beat up by us at the CCAC to give us money. We started two really good programs there. One was not just home first, but it was home first um, and home first plus. For two and a half years, we looked after somebody to keep them at home. We had 12% of the people that were absolutely eligible for long-term care and or placement in a retirement home or somewhere else, they actually took their name off of a long-term care wait list. We increased our ability to have people and come to the end of their life in their home with their family by 6%. That was amazing. So if we can actually talk to people about where do they want to be, mobilize their family, <coughs> have them get care where they need to get care, provide the socialization, the activation, the recreation that they need through adult day programs, we can relieve the burden of the hospital. And I'll stop by saying, our Lynn gave us $150,000 one year, close to the end of the year. And instead of doing the traditional home care services, we decided we want a medication management support service program. We actually won a few awards, and this was back in 2012, international awards and Canadian awards from a public service perspective and from IHI. And what we found when we sent a pharmacist with a CCAC coordinator into a home to review someone's medication in the privacy of their home versus when they were walking out the door from the hospital with their bag of medications, was that we were able to reduce their medications on average by two pills a day. But what that equaled to was we reduced their falls by 67%, reduced their trips to eMERGE by 80%, managed their pain better by 54%, and the bottom line, they told us they just felt better because we were able to optimize their medications in their home where they were taking them. So I'm all for home and community care. Thank you, Kathy. We'll, we'll switch gear. Um, I think we're all aware of the uh, tragedy that we see unfolding every day with uh, the opiate overdoses and deaths. Uh, thousands of Canadians have died and continue to die at a daily rate. Um, this uh, often um, covers up the discussion of the fact that many Canadians live with chronic pain, 
Ian Gilron is an expert on pain, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about pain and the various ramifications from a health policy perspective. Thank you, David. Thanks for inviting me to speak, and thanks for all of you for coming. I, I guess one of the themes of health policy is rationalizing resources, and most of us have, through our career trajectories and our passions, sort of become advocates for one uh, portion of the population at need. So, um, as David says, this is something fairly different. I'm going to get on my soapbox and try to convince you that uh, we need to actually get more health, health policy attention and resources towards the care of uh, patients suffering from chronic pain. So this is intuitive to most people, but it's, it bears kind of desc describing the fact that, that chronic pain uh, can occur in all age groups, uh, is commonly associated with other diseases like cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and arthritis, and is also a complication of surgery and trauma. Uh, and chronic pain affects one in five Canadians, and some estimates even suggest higher than that. Uh, and that means that several of you here today suffer from chronic pain on a daily basis, uh, and most of you know someone who is close to you uh, who suffers from, from chronic pain. So just just to review a little bit of uh, biology, uh, I think we always need to remember that our nervous system is very strongly wired to make sure that pain functions as a warning signal uh, for health problems, for example, chest pain for an impending heart attack, uh, abdominal pain, let's say, with, for a ruptured appendix, or pain anywhere in the body that uh, signals the growth of a new cancer. Uh, but other than this protective function, sometimes uh, pain for, for reasons that we don't completely understand becomes chronic and actually serves no purpose to us at all but just to cause needless suffering. Uh, and really, it's such a subjective experience that, you know, it's hard to really explain this without giving you a, a patient narrative. So here are some experts from a person, uh, excerpts from a personal narrative from someone who suffers from chronic pain. So I'll read you the, the quote. Uh, I suffer from 24-7 pain for the past seven years after a hiking accident uh, where I broke my ankle. A month later, I started getting shooting pains in my feet and was then diagnosed with CRPS, or Complex Regional Pain Syndrome. I feel burning sensations, stabbing pain, and coldness, and also skin color changes in my, in my left foot. It is hard to explain more than that as words are not enough. I've been tried on many different treatments uh, with little benefit and I'm still desperate as the pain is continuous. The worst thing is the loss of the life that I once knew, driving, traveling, boating, hiking, fishing, cooking, being independent and not having to rely on my wife to do everything and just to enjoy life. Uh, it has been difficult to cope, uh, but the love and support for my family has given me hope and hope is what I need to keep going with pain levels above 10 out of 10 every hour of the day. That's the end of that quote. Um, important to recognize recently the International Classification of Disease, ICD-11 version, uh, has recently classified chronic pain as a disease in its own right, uh, and researchers continue to search for cures for this needless chronic pain. Um, when, when pain becomes chronic for months or years, we also need to recognize the, the challenges to medical practitioners because one challenge is to continue at evaluating the patient to make sure that any treatable or reversible causes uh, are found. So someone with chronic low back pain for 20 years can still develop a serious kidney tumor or some other problem that presents with back pain and you, th those things are intertwined uh, in terms of clinical evaluation. Um, but in the meantime, a second challenge is to seek treatment efforts that reduce pain and the effect of pain on one's emotional and physical function. So pain specialists and, and researchers have long recognized the need to focus pain management efforts on recovery and improved function. So reducing the pain or eliminating the pain may not be possible, uh, but there are many, many other coping uh, treatment uh, effects that, that can uh, help us with recovery and uh, functional improvement. This is being done using a multimodal and multidisciplinary approach that addresses the biological, psychological, and the social aspects of chronic pain. And now the, the evolution of the opioid crisis over the past 20 years in North America uh, has taught us that relying exclusively on drug therapy for chronic pain is quite often ineffective uh, and, and certainly in the case of opioids can be unsafe. Uh, because of this, a thoughtful, 
stepped care, multimodal, multidisciplinary approach to chronic pain is very often needed. Now, as with other complex chronic diseases, such as multi-organ <laughs> blood vessel disease and diabetes, uh, best care practices for chronic pain, including physical, pharmacological, psychological, and even social work interventions are often needed. And this long-term multidisciplinary care takes a lot of resources, uh, and currently there are not enough resources being allocated to chronic pain care. So uh, there is uh, a light at the end of the tunnel, uh, never waste a good crisis. So there's been a lot of momentum uh, with, with people that have been really working to advance the, 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 the cause of chronic pain management. And the, the opioid crisis has shown us that uh, the healthcare needs of patients with chronic pain cannot be neglected. So over the past five years or so, synchronized efforts by the Canadian Pain Society, uh, the CIHR Spore Chronic Pain Network that we're involved with, uh, and as well the Health, Can Health Canada Canadian Pain Task Force, uh, are being geared towards the development of a Canadian pain strategy that will improve the assessment and management of patients suffering from chronic pain. Uh, however, this will require sort of growing engagement with health policymakers uh, and an expansion of health resources in this area. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. We'll lurch sideways again and ask Richard uh, to talk about health workforce and payment. Uh, as I said earlier, the way in which people are paid will often alter the trajectory of what they do, how they perform. And uh, Richard knows a lot about this. Go ahead. There we go. Thank you. Well, we're certainly asking a lot of uh, people in the broader health community. We're asking a lot of them. So um, how are we actually going to pay people for all of this? Um, and it's become, um, in my view, at any rate, a fundamental policy issue. So uh, two, two major challenges in compensation, I think, need to be addressed. Um, the first is with respect to optimizing the pay systems and structures and how pay is actually determined. So for example, with physicians, we currently have fee-for-service, we have capitation, we have salary, we have uh, an almost endless number of blended models. And uh, overlaying this, we have a somewhat blunt idea that the model or models for primary care ought to uh, differ uh, from that of various specialists. The way we ought to think about compensation systems is that they can provide a lever to align and support achieving the desired healthcare outcomes as well as the preferences of healthcare workers. Okay. It's widely understood in the study of compensation that the alignment of pay levels oh, and pay modes with the desired outcomes is critical to achieving those outcomes, especially where the services being produced are labor intensive and labor is highly skilled as it is in healthcare. And where it also comprises, in the case of healthcare, a very large proportion of total expenditures. It's also understood that alternative pay methods have very different incentive effects, and the need to seriously address this issue is perhaps one of the biggest elephants in the comp room. Pay levels are only a uh, limited source of incentives, however, pay levels. True for physicians, for example, because more pay yields diminishing returns in terms of creating those incentives, and there is no meaningful risk of being terminated that is to say there's no real meaningful downside risk. Overall pay levels may roughly reflect physician education and skill levels, uh, but certainly they're not determined in anything that we would refer to as a marketplace. And there's little in the way of pay for performance referred to in the literature as incentive intensity. So as an example, if the overarching objective is increased emphasis on promoting health in the population, so uh, by that I mean rewarding health providers who provide lifestyle guidance relative to the current uh, emphasis on provision of care in response to adverse health events, then the compensation system should be aligned with this objective and incentivize the provision of the level and type of services that support those types of outcomes. Examining and accounting for the emerging preferences of health providers, what I would refer to as the supply side, for alternative forms of compensation and other terms and conditions of work also needs to be a part of the process 
of aligning compensation systems within the broader system. So here an example would be accounting for intergenerational uh, differences in preferences for work-life balance. Overall, there's a dearth of uh, research evidence on what types of pay models would be best suited to achieving these sorts of alignments. There is a second major challenge, more at a macro level, and that challenge concerns the functioning of the broader system we have for determining compensation. And again, I'll use uh, physicians as a bit of a pressing example. The policy pressure is ongoing, and it takes the form of increases in aggregate compensation costs. So the focus, the policy focus, is on the pay envelope, which is currently formally negotiated at the province-wide level in what is effectively a form of collective bargaining. And as a part of this process, the most recent pay package has been subject to intensive interest arbitration. These processes increasingly determine pay relativities across physicians and work settings, such as hospitals, clinics, and so forth, but are not necessarily either equitable or efficient. Compensation costs in some pay structures are essentially set through a labor relations framework that is evolved unsystematically it's under visible signs of stress and may not, in fact, be well suited in its design to meeting the objectives and pressures in the healthcare system. So in order to achieve greater incentives to promote health, pay systems need to be optimized in relation to the particular setting in which the health services are delivered. The adoption of a fairly traditional labor relations system and its impact on pay relativities and levels, in my view, needs to be significantly reconsidered. Done. Thank you, Richard. And uh, last but not least, uh, Kieran Moore, our Medical Officer of Health. Um, uh, in terms of health policy, what preoccupies you, uh, Kieran? Preoccupies, not occupies. <laughs> For some reason, we get pulled in multiple different directions, uh, and certainly, uh, as Ian has said, never waste a good crisis. We are in somewhat of a response mode at present uh, with a pesky little virus uh, that is spreading internationally, and I'll, and I'll get to that in a second, but I, I did want to say uh, that uh, I thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here today. I thank the presenters. Uh, I, I heard, and perhaps that's my public health prevention focus, that we had a lot of discussion about avoiding frailty. Uh, keeping people well, keeping people out of the health system, uh, providing innovative new care that shortens uh, their length of stay in hospital when required, and, and adopting these innovations. I heard that we have to have incentives to keep people healthy and, and for the workforce uh, to be uh, promoting a health promotion, uh, and that we have to deal with some uh, ongoing population-wide threats like uh, uh, the, the chronic pain epidemic. Uh, I get uh, uh, an email of every overdose uh, that occurs in our community that uh, an EMS responds to, and the numbers over the last five days have skyrocketed. I'm trying to get public attention to this, I'm trying to get press releases, and because of COVID and other threats, uh, I've gotten very little attention. I certainly, I've, I've signaled to our healthcare partners that we've seen this across the province. There's a new drug in town, it's fentanyl laced with a, a benzodiazepine, a, a which is a, another sedative hypnotic which does not respond to naloxone and that spike has been in the last five days across the province and uh, significantly in our community with three overdoses just last night. Um, so we and in public health and in public policy must be dealing with multiple different issues at multiple different times uh, and must always keep in mind the big ticket threats to the health of our population. If you sit back and think what are the things that kill us that are the big ticket issues that have prevention associated with them the number one, two, three, four, five causes of death in our community are, I'll give you five seconds to think about it. Number five major causes of death. Okay, Kathy, you're, you're getting there, you're getting there. So number one, it's malignant diseases is the number one killer. And certainly from a health policy vantage point, there's tremendous policy that still has to be uh, uh, pushed uh, if we had a healthy public policy by this government uh, on tobacco and on alcohol, two carcinogens uh, or, or have carcinogens in them in the place of tobacco um, as major threats still uh, in this community. And we're going to get overwhelmed with COVID information. Ten people die a month of lung cancer in our community every month. 
uh, and we can't forget that what truly is causing harm and death in our community on a daily basis. And we spend a tremendous amount of money uh, trying to keep these people uh, um, well in their last years of life as they go through chronic illnesses and then through the malignancy. Uh, and it's a tremendous health cost burden and family burden for these diseases, many of which are preventable. We can't lose sight of that. Secondarily, uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, we have uh, around 300 deaths a year uh, in our community from cardiovascular deaths and then cerebrovascular deaths. Accidents and injuries still are number four in our community and overdoses are considered accidental deaths for the most part. Most of them, 95% are accidental and not suicides and that cause of death is rising and the youth in our community are dying disproportionately from overdose as a cause of death and causing our life expectancy as a community to go down because that 25 to 44 population is dying from their exposure to these drugs in our community. Uh, the fifth is uh, chronic obstructive lung disease, again preventable through good tobacco strategies, uh, which our government has not been willing to uh, uh, embrace fully. We must have a tobacco end game in our community uh, uh, as that exposure affects health uh, across multiple disease groups uh, and is uh, all preventable. And then, only then, do we get into infectious disease uh, deaths. So uh, influenza and pneumonias as the sixth. So talking about uh, influenza, pneumonias, and other respiratory pathogens, yes, we have COVID-19 uh, uh, circulating around the globe at a tremendously rapid rate. Uh, I, I watch a couple of websites if you want a worldometer as a wonderful website that keeps up-to-date tracking around the globe uh, and it'll prompt you to uh, touch the coronavirus uh, tracker. So 97,841 people affected by this virus to date with 3,352 deaths. Put that in perspective, it's small. It's small on the overarching causes of death in our community, but uh, it is gathering the attention at present. And it's important to point out that over 54,000 people have already recovered from this. Uh, it is a threat, though, uh, to international travel and trade, uh, and, and is spreading rapidly around the globe. We have no population health immunity to this. This is a novel, new uh, virus, uh, and hence we are all susceptible to it. The things that you can do to prevent yourself from getting infected are washing your hands frequently, not bringing your hands to your face, social distancing ourselves two meters from anyone coughing and I have a cough -o meter uh, going right now and I, I listen for coughs in the room. Uh, I can tell you uh, once we get COVID in our community we've done lots of testing. We have no positives in KFLNA uh, or in this region of Eastern Ontario but we will and we must prepare for it. And as Kathy said, and we, are, uh, we in the health system are preparing for the eventuality that we will get cases. But you can take these basic precautions of hand washing, social distancing, I'd avoid mass gatherings, uh, I have stopped international travel, I'm not going to medical conventions that I had planned even for April and May of this year. I've canceled, I will attend by Zoom, and we are creating a policy for Queens. Uh, I, not, I would agree that uh, non-essential travel should be canceled. Uh, at Queen's uh, uh, as a basic precautionary uh, uh, action. It is anticipated that this virus will enter our community. It will um, hopefully not spread quickly. And our job as a community right now is containment, is the early detection of the first cases in, in our community, then quarantining their contacts, Around 10% of the contacts may get COVID-19, so we'll be watching them very closely, and then um, monitoring for any spread elsewhere in the community. I promise you, if we get spread in a university setting or in a school setting, those schools and, uh, will be closed. The university and colleges will be closed. That is our only public health measure, is isolation and quarantine. We don't have a vaccine, we don't have antivirals, but we're prepared to take the action that's required to protect our community. In China, in Wuhan, we have no idea of what's happening in, uh, for children with this virus because the outbreak in Wuhan started when children were not in school and they never let them go back in school. So in terms of data that we don't really know about, we don't know how this will affect the children. 
the very young, just like an influenza, probably will have a significant illness and probably will have uh, pneumonias and a requirement for admission. As we know, the very old in China are having uh, the requirement for oxygen and ventilatory support. Um, but in a, an abundance of precaution, we don't want uh, our children exposed to this virus until we get further science of how they could be affected. So we're, we are working diligently. We're prepared to work with our community um, to uh, identify the first cases in any returning travelers that we've worked with have been very diligent, whether uh, they've been from South Korea or Italy or China at present, to self-isolate and to contact public health. At present, two countries, uh, well, two areas, uh, Wuhan and Hubei province, uh, if you're returning from that area, you must contact local public health. We will follow you for 14 days. We will test you if you get symptoms. The main symptoms are fever and or cough and or difficulty breathing or shortness of breath. If you get those, we will go to your home, we will swab you, uh, and we will see if you have the virus, and then we will follow up on all of your contacts. Uh, and, and that is going to be our containment strategy for the foreseeable future, to detect early cases and prevent transmission in the community, uh, and prepare our health system for the potential of a surge in visits, which I hope doesn't come. I hope we can contain, 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 and contain for as long as we can until we know if there's any antiviral medications and or a vaccine in a year or two that could be potentially be publicly available. I'll stop there. Thank you, I want to congratulate the panel and thank them for staying to time. That's Remarkable and wonderful. Uh, we're open for questions. Um, do we have any? Uh, thank you, Mark. There's one here. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Thank you. Um, uh, I'll make a statement and followed by a question. Uh, the statement is um, digital health is here and it's rapidly emerging globally. Uh, the question is, how can digital health, digital medicine, digital therapeutics reshape and even impact the provider, which is the uh, aging population, the home care? Uh, how can it uh, impact the payer, uh, the business model in the health care, and the big pharma? Uh, and, how, and, and lastly, how it's going to impact the patient? Uh, maybe uh, some of you can make a comment. I, I think uh, we have a long ways to go in terms of digital health in Ontario. We still haven't had integrated primary care electronic health record and the hospital record. I know of some hospitals that allow patients to access the record. They can see the appointment uh, uh, assessment the very next day. I think that's brilliant to be as transparent uh, and timely with patients to allow them to have instant access. Uh, we. So that, that integration, though, of the primary care and the secondary hasn't occurred. As an eMERGE physician, I should be able to see what's going on in the primary care setting, what the diagnoses are, what the, what the uh, medications are. There's still a huge disconnect uh, there, and, and it's upsetting that we haven't gotten there yet. In terms of the threat of a, an infectious disease epidemic over the next two years, we need virtual care, too. So we need electronic care where I can see you at your home, I can get your vital signs done, I can do an assessment of whether you need to go to hospital or not just by uh, uh, your physical physically looking at you and getting some basic parameters. That is, I think, going to be an impetus over the next uh, several months to have the virtual care piece done um, where we can look at you, get your vital signs, and coordinate your care without you having to socially connect in a healthcare setting because it's going to be too risky for all of us. Uh, and from a public health surveillance vantage point, uh, you know, we like looking at incidence of disease and, and, and the chronicity of disease and the cost of disease. Once we get electronic systems together, we can and create a, a dashboard of, of the costs, the incidents, uh, the outcomes uh, in, in, a, in a big data format that can enable improved uh, uh, monitoring of the system uh, and uh, situational awareness for decision makers. John, then Kathy. Um, so, uh, so just just to add a bit to that, I I think uh, digital health has uh, has the potential to to transform how we actually um, 
care for an older population. And it goes outside of, of actually EMRs and systems in, in the healthcare because they can be used to, to things for, for example, keep an up-to-date inventory of community resources that can then actually be made available to, uh, to people. They can actually be used to track the progression of frailty. They can be used to target to reduce social isolation. So we haven't quite um, gotten there yet. The challenge will be to take all these isolated pockets of excellence and development and integrate them into one system that actually talks to each other, which we, can, we haven't done in EMRs yet. And, then, and I shudder to think about all the things that are happening when we take into account wearables, sensors, um, mining of social media to do all these things. And that's going to be the challenge going forward, but I think it will be truly transformative if we can do that. Kathy? Yes, I think to let you know that the whole region, the hospital CEOs at the six hospitals in the southeast area have come together to, and committed to one um, record. Um, Providence Care has been very vocal that it has to be one person, one record, not just one record for the hospitals to use. And in that, there is the intention from our perspective that the person, patient, client, resident have complete access to their record, much like my chart in Toronto, I, uh, the CCAC that I was at, we had implemented my chart and we were well on the way to that kind of a system. The other side of it is looking at some of the traditional um, electronic records are very hospital focused. The, it was clear in the requirements in the RFP that this, do, this software had to be um, able to connect without just an integration engine, primary care, subacute care, long-term care, community-based care, and hospital care. And that was made very clear to the people that were submitting RFPs. We're well on the way. We're hoping by sometime in April to be able to start negotiating with a preferred provider. Uh, and we believe we've got something that will be there. Having said that, by the time we implement it, it's going to be out of date. And I have a feeling everybody with one of these is going to push the system in a whole different way. And I'm looking forward to that because I actually think people need to look after their own record whether or not it's in paper or whether or not it's your own thing and then you give me your card and I and that takes all the privacy away you got your record that you're responsible for I might have the last entry onto it so if you lose your card I can reestablish it or there's a reestablishment center but I think we need to engage people in a different way and I think people like checking life labs or Dynacare for their results and knowing whether they're normal or not and I think it's going to push us faster than the system is currently going or your watch yeah I don't uh, I'll ask Chris. Chris is actually going to speak uh, as some of the other members of the panel in 8.36. Uh, the question he's going to answer then in May is, why did Google buy Fitbit? Which they did. Um, it's a good question. I, uh, for many billions of dollars. Go ahead, Chris. Answer this question. I, I get emails every day from patients now saying that their Fitbit or their uh, Apple Watch told them that their heart is not normal. And uh, <laughs> their, their heart is almost always normal. So we, we've, got to, we've got to worry, yeah, what is my email? Good luck. Um, the, the point I, I just wanted to sort of sum up a little bit, I mean, digital health is a broad category. Um, I think there's great business cases to be made for virtual care. I mean, Kaiser Permanente has figured this out. Over 50% of all patient encounters are now done virtually, and that was one of the cornerstones of their, of their uh, efficiency uh, model. Um, but I wanted to add, you know, to tie in some of the other comments, that our, our local AFP, CIMO, Southeastern Ontario Academic Medical Organization, which uh, uh, pays in an AF, a comprehensive AFP model, almost all of the specialists in Southeastern Ontario, about 350 of us now. Um, we have a, a, an accountability uh, framework which uh, requires us to do certain amounts of clinical volumes, uh, deliver certain academic deliverables, but in our accountability design refresh recently, we're building in 
uh, a responsibility for all departments to develop a digital health strategy. So it's quite unique for a physician organization to take some, uh, you know, tentative steps toward a more, uh, you know, um, forward-thinking accountability structure. And if we can imagine a future where we say, okay, you're going to be accountable for developing, you know, tools, you can imagine a future where we might actually be accountable for outcomes instead of outputs. And that, that would be, I think, the, uh, the dream outcome of this kind of an evolution. Can I'm I just going to interrupt because we are at time, but there's one important question here for Kieran, uh, which is uh, influenza kills and infects more people every year. Why are we so concerned for quarantine and isolation for the coronavirus, but not influenza? So on average, in, in Canada, there'd be 12,000 admissions for influenza with around 3,500 deaths. Uh, that's an attack rate around 10%. Uh, in influenza, we have uh, antiviral medications. We have a vaccine that this year has been highly effective. Uh, and uh, at least 40% of our population on an annualized basis is protected by immunization. Uh, and for this virus, we have zero. Uh, and so the only, only issues we have to control this are public health uh, methods of early identification, isolation, quarantine, and uh, mass closures uh, uh, of, of mass gatherings and institutions where, where they can harbor infection. Uh, we may, ha and that's why we're trying to delay this. We're, we're in the detainment phase of this virus uh, as long as we can to prevent wide uh, community spread so that we can get weapons to help us. And we have very few right now. With that, it's time, so I'll thank the panel very much. You're all very busy people. Um, appreciate this, and thank you for coming. We will do this again.